far off the beaten path did Jesus go to meet you? On the path to personally encountering over 500 people in the 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus intentionally pursued four people that we see documented in the Bible to show us that he knows what you need to believe and is willing to go the extra mile to meet you personally. Last week, we saw Jesus meet Mary Magdalene in the garden of her waiting with simply a word, her name. With that, she knew him. Today, we encounter Cleopas, who, brokenhearted at Jesus' crucifixion, he needed more than a word to believe. He needed a physical experience with Jesus that he could relate to, to help him believe. We pick up this event in Jesus' resurrected ministry in Luke 24, verse 13. The conversation begins like this. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Verse 15, as they talked and discussed, this word discussed, it's different than just talking. It is the word syzeteo in the Greek language, which means to strongly debate. Some of you are very familiar with this term, to strongly debate. They, they were strongly talking and discussing these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, this is not so weird. I'm going to put a comma there. This is not so weird. How many times in your life have you not noticed God walking with you? Going on in verse 17, he asked them, this is Jesus. He asked them, what are you discussing? This is that word, Sizateo. What are you strongly debating here together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Verse 19. What things, Jesus asked? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. They knew him as prophet. They knew him as prophet, meaning one who could tell you what was on God's heart, but not as their personal rescuer yet. Verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers, Cleopas goes on, says, handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. They actually knew something was supposed to happen on the third day, but they didn't know what. Verse 22, the conversation continues. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen visions of angels and said, he's alive. In verse 24, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, this is Jesus talking. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village, this is in verse 28, we're continuing the conversation. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay. I want you to circle this word. 
circle this word in your Bible or on your phone or wherever you're doing it. Highlight this word. It is an incredibly important word. They urged him strongly, stay. The word is meno in the Greek language, and it means stay, dwell with, continue with me, abide with me, to indwell, to be permanent in this moment. They urged Cleopas, urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Same word. He went in to dwell with, to continue with, to abide with, to indwell, to be permanent, to be permanently in this moment. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he began to give it to them. You might remember this moment that Jesus did this very same thing four days prior at the Last Supper or the last Passover Seder he celebrated with his people. In Luke 22, 19, Jesus did exactly the same thing. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is Cleopas's moment. Verse 31 their eyes were opened and they recognized him and then he disappeared from their sight they asked each other were not our hearts burning this is a weird word it's not really well translated in modern english but it is the right word to use were our hearts not kyle which means kindled or lit up or fired up or consumed in the moment were our was were our hearts not totally lit up and kindled in this moment while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned once to Jerusalem. They couldn't wait any longer. They could not wait any longer to tell their friends about what had happened. And there they found the 11 and with them, 11 and those with them assembled together. And those together, this is, don't misinterpret verse 34. Those who were already there together said, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And this is what Cleopas came into. And then the two, Cleopas and his friend, they told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them as he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. Jesus is on the road to meet you. In whatever emotional state you are in today, he is on the road to meet you. Let's go back and break into their encounter a little bit deeper. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing? Meaning, this is that word, sizateo, which means to strongly debate. What are you debating as you walk along this road? And they stood there with their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas. He says, are you the only one visiting here? Are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on? And I love Jesus' response. Jesus says, what things are going on? And they said the things about Jesus of Nazareth. And then they started to define their relationship with Jesus, that he is a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all people. Now let's make this present and personal. You fly into Seattle around last Thanksgiving to go visit family. And you get in a cab and you take the cab from the airport to your family's home and, and uh, you overhear the cab driver talking, hotly debating on his cell phone with someone about the riots and the no police zone that now actually encircles the neighborhood where you grew up, the same neighborhood where your parents currently live. And, and, and now you're headed there near downtown Seattle. You ask the cab driver, what, what is he talking about? And he turns around and he gives you that confused, forlorn look while saying, are you the only one here who doesn't know what's going on right now? 
Haven't you seen what's happening here or been paying attention to the news about what is happening in the town that you are currently visiting? But you want to hear what he actually thinks so that you know how to interact on this subject, a subject that you've obviously been paying attention to. So you say, huh, what things? Now you get to actually hear what someone else thinks instead of opening with your own opinion. You are being quick to listen and slow to speak and even slower to get upset or frustrated or angry on this subject. You actually want to know what someone else thinks. Now, to be clear, parents, we do this to discover how much your kids will actually tell you. There are days when you know exactly what happened at school, but you want to hear what they're going to say about it. Jesus is showing us how to enter a conversation where there are obviously strong opinions and even stronger emotions. He asks a question to elicit a personal response from the hearer. Jesus wants to know what's on your mind, what is troubling your heart. Let me say it again. Jesus wants to know what's on your mind and what is troubling your heart. Now, you might say in the case of the resurrected Jesus, well, he already knows, probably. But you getting it out of your mouth reveals the content of your heart on the subject. Getting it out of your mouth keeps it from being bottled up and eventually blowing up in discouragement or destructive internal conversations. Does anyone else have those self-talk rambles that end sometimes in destructive ways? This level of conversation with Jesus today in the era of the Holy Spirit living in you is called prayer. Jesus wants to hear you, your concerns, your challenges, your frustrations. He wants to hear them come out of your mouth, not just overhear your thoughts. In Matthew 6, Jesus gives us some direction on this in a well-known instructional called the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, our Father in heaven, say this with me if you know this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus shows us the practice of prayer is opening our heart and mouth before the Lord regarding real life stuff. Jesus is so serious about connecting with you on real life stuff that he asks you personally. This is a personal invitation from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me when you are weak and heavy burdened. He says, I will give you rest. To come to Jesus and lay your burdens down. Make the exchange, your grief and weariness for his joy and for his strength. Because Jesus lived physically in this world, experiencing the same manipulations and power struggles of the world that we do, and yet did not break, we have a place, a person in Jesus who knows that we need his help. He opens his throne of grace to you today. In Hebrews 4, 16, he says, Now come and approach the throne of grace with confidence that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Jesus shows us how to enter a difficult conversation and how to listen fully 
first. But he shows us that he's willing to do that with you now. To listen fully. Jesus could have cut Cleopas off and told him that they were that, 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 that told him what they needed to hear right then, but he waited for this catalytic moment in verse 21, a moment that would bring personal clarity and ownership of Cleopas's faith. Jesus listened to him explain what happened to his friend. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. He goes on to tell Jesus how their own leaders, people they were supposed to be able to trust, who were were supposed to have their best interest in mind, people who they had supported and obeyed because it was the right thing to do before God, how they had betrayed their hope. Look at verse 20. This is Cleopas talking. He says, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. In verse 21, this is a key catalytic moment, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Cleopas said, we had hoped he was the one who would redeem us. We hoped he was the one who would restore our dignity as a nation and our future. How many times have you placed your hope in something other than the truth of God's word and the truth of his promises? I asked myself this question all week long as I was preparing for this, how many times do I have to make this same mistake? Hoping things will go one way and, and even placing my hope in, in someone or, or a system to just be disappointed because the people or system go another direction, doing things differently than they said they would. Not All people fail in this all the time, but all people will fail at this sometime. Jesus is listening to you. He's listening and he's available now. His throne is open for his people to confidently approach and find grace and mercy to help in their times of need, in their times of disappointment. You see, prayer works when Jesus is at the center of it, and we don't give up on it. Like Cleopas, we're looking for hope. Hope that our family and our friends and our coworkers and neighbors will be redeemed, that they will have their eternal dignity restored. But where do we put that hope? Cleopas said we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Psalm 30 verses 20 through 22 says this, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. You could say that when in your home every single day, over your family, we, my family, we, my neighborhood, we, my city, we, my nation, we, my people, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. He is our help and our shield. In Him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Cleopas and the 120 followers of Jesus at the time of the cross had placed their hope in Jesus as the physical Messiah that would redeem the national identity of the nation of Israel, but their expectations were wrong. Right hope, wrong expectation. They had been taught something that was not in the scriptures, that the Messiah would not have to suffer and die before his power would be truly revealed. 
They allowed a proper hope to inflate their expectations beyond the truth of God's word. Let me explain. For years, we have discipled people using an amazing tool that I am looking forward to kicking off again. It's called Operation Solid Lives or OSL. I know that discipleship is the highest order for my life in Christ. And discipling people, is, it's not optional in Jesus' world of leadership. So, so we started formally discipling people as a church. We hit this really hard for many years. And my, my hope was fulfilled. People fell in love with the Word of God. They fell in love with community and the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But my expectations were amiss. My expectation was that the people that were being discipled would in turn stay here in Pacifica and on the coast, but you know, our coastal region, they would stay here on the coast forever, committed to discipling others. Right hope, wrong expectation. I had hoped and expected that people would stay here on the coast and reproduce discipleship over and over again. But people started moving, a lot of people. And my, expe my expectation was that they would stay. But that expectation was never in my wheelhouse to control or maintain. You see, God was using a tool and people committed to making disciples to equip his people to send them into the harvest fields of other cities and communities. People moving all over the country from here, people who have been discipled and equipped. It was this, as if God was saying to them, okay, you're ready, let's go. I wanted them to stay and God wanted to plant them in other places around the country. Who do you think got their way? Well, it's obvious. They moved. Praise God. I miss them desperately. There's, there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss the people that we have discipled. But I know that they are pursuing what God has for them, which is bigger than what I had for them. You see, discipleship, it's the right hope, but staying here was the wrong expectation. Cleopas shared, we had hoped he would be the one we wanted him to be, the one we had taught, been taught that he would be. We had hoped he would redeem Israel. That is exactly what Jesus did. But these guys, they didn't recognize it yet. H have you been in that headspace before where, where Jesus has already done something, but in your grief, anguish, despair, or hopelessness, or busyness, you can't see that it's already done or it's already finished? Jesus is interceding for you. He's at the right hand of the Father right now, interceding for you. He is the advocate we have with the Father who hears us. He has given us the Holy Spirit right now to live in us to be our advocate from the Father, from the Father. One is with the Father, one is from the Father right now. They are both interceding for us. Is there something you are holding on to that Jesus has already addressed and has already accomplished? He's already finished the job of, perhaps guilt or shame that you've held on to throughout your life. Holding on to something that Jesus has already finished working through for you. It might sound like I can't forgive myself or I can't let go or forgive them. Or, or maybe you are the one who's holding a grudge that God is so over with already. Have you confessed that sin? Have you confessed the sin that birthed the guilt or shame? If the answer is yes, then Jesus has forgiven you. So why are you still holding on to the guilt? Is it easier to hold on to it versus let it go? Or does the guilt reinforce your personal narrative? That if you actually let go of guilt, shame, fear, self-loathing, you might have to do the work of discovering who God created you to be instead of who the enemy wants you to believe you are. 
Jesus has dealt with the guilt and shame of your failure. It's already done. It's under the blood of Christ. It's washed as far as the east is from the rest. You are already a new creation in Christ, but for some reason you can't see it yet or feel it yet. When Cleopas dropped this on Jesus, Jesus took him on a walk to reveal the truth. Jesus had to get him out of the space. He had, to, he had to meet him on his ground. Jesus had to get him on the road somewhere. Listen, today Jesus wants to meet you on the road somewhere where you are headed. It doesn't matter if you don't have a destination in mind, if you are walking aimlessly through your life. Jesus said, I am on the road and I want to meet you now. Jesus walked with him and listening until it was time to reveal the truth. Now, Jesus, when he opens his mouth to Cleopas, it is not gentle. There is something for every cynic and every faith doubter in the way Jesus speaks to Cleopas. If this event were not true and real, who would have documented the interaction like this? Who would reveal their foolishness outside the context of the truth? No one. One commentator puts it like this. No hero in their own story wants to look foolish to make a point. Cleopas included. Jesus takes Cleopas on a walk that will reinforce his hope, inform his expectations, and anchor his faith. Jesus takes Cleopas through the word that he had been taught showing him the truth of the Messiah's life, his death, his resurrection, found in the prophets of Daniel, Hezekiah, and Isaiah. Jesus opened the story of the Bible for him to see and understand. Finally, they arrive at Cleopas' home, and the debate is over. Cleopas invites Jesus to dinner. In verse 29, it says this, but they urged him, meaning Jesus, they urged Jesus strongly to stay. No matter where you are on the road, Jesus is going to keep moving until you invite him to stay. They urged him strongly. Why? Because Jesus was actually looking like he was just going to keep going until they said, no, 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 no. Meno, which means stay, dwell, continue, abide in this moment, indwell in this moment, be permanent in this moment. Cleopas made the invitation for Jesus to remain, even though he wasn't 100% sure who this person was. He wanted to know more, so he invited him in to stay. And that is when Cleopas's faith was secured. Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus says, Here I am standing at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will be with that person and they with me. Cleopas invites Jesus into his life, his home. And Jesus says, yes. And as they sat down and ate, a moment of clarity becomes reality. Jesus took some bread and broke it. As soon as he offered it to them, boom, the lights went on. They had seen him before. They know the one they had been talking to is Jesus, the resurrected redeemer of humanity. For Mary, Jesus knew, Mary Magdalene, Jesus knew it was hearing, hearing a single word from the Lord that she needed, that she would recognize. Why? Because she has different faith. For Cleopas, it was seeing. He heard Jesus say a lot, but once he saw Jesus do something he could relate to, his eyes were opened. Jesus is committed to either way of getting to you. Jesus is committed to reaching you in a way you will receive. 
no matter which mode Jesus uses on his walk to pursue you, your response will require a step of faith. Even for the believing person today, opening the door and allowing Jesus in requires a step of faith. Now, I'm no longer talking about the big step of salvation by faith that Mary and Cleopas took, but the step of allowing Jesus into every compartment of your life. Now, I I hear and read regularly about the need to compartmentalize to put each segment of your life into a neat little box, into a neat little compartment, into these compartments that are separated from each other. So when one part suffers an impact or tragedy, the other parts, they stay functional. Now, if this is your, I'm saying this with a little sarcasm, but if this is your personal strategy for emotional health in the 21st century, you may have to open a lot of doors to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Why not just fling the doors open to your whole life today and invite Jesus into every facet of you? What do you need from the Lord to make that happen today? Ask Him. Seek Him. Continue to invite Him in. When you recognize that there's a door that's closed off to Him, just open it. Don't debate. Don't negotiate. Don't ignore it. Don't deny it. Just open the door. I hope you will discover today that even though there are areas of your life that you have not or will not allow Jesus to redeem, Jesus is waiting and knocking on those doors. These doors may be marked by fear, guilt, shame, anxiety, a secret sin, among other things. But will you invite Jesus into your spiritual home today? And allow Him to be the source of your hope, the truth in your expectations, and ignite a new fire of passion and joy in your life that will not be snuffed out in this world. In conclusion, one statement a lot of people will recount in in this post-resurrection event is Cleopas saying, After this whole conversation happens and he sees his eyes open and Jesus leaves, he says, weren't our hearts burning within us as we talked on the road as he opened the scriptures to us? The word burned, though a decent transliteration of the original language, is it's a little dated in English. The word is kaio, K-A-I-O. It means kindled or lit up, fired up. A spark that consumes the moment. Our hearts were ignited to long for this one he spoke of. Igniting a flame that kept our attention and our focus. A flame that would eventually consume our doubts and disbelief. You see, the word of God is the light to our path. It's an ignition point that can consume a lifetime of doubt. Listen, will you open the doors and allow Jesus to ignite a new flame in your heart? Will you allow him in his word to ignite something new in and through you? We've all experienced this. We've all had that moment where where there's something that ignites us, that fires us up. This morning, I I want to invite you to get fired up for the kingdom. Not on your own and not to whoop, 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 but to allow the Holy Spirit in to ignite a new flame in your heart that will consume the moment of toxic thoughts, that will consume the moments of desperation, a spark in your heart that will light the forest of past on fire and just let it go. The forest of your past that Jesus says, listen, I'm not even looking at that stuff anymore. Maybe you should stop. Jesus wants to know what's on your mind. What is troubling your heart? Have you lost hope that Jesus is the one who who will restore your dignity and your future? 
like Cleopas. Sometimes we're looking for hope. Hope that our family and our friends or our co-workers and our neighbors will be redeemed. Will have their eternal dignity intact. But where do we put that hope? Psalm 33 says, may your unfailing love be with us. Even as we put our hope in you. Jesus took Cleopas on a walk that would refocus his hope and inform his expectations and anchor his faith. A walk through the truth of God's word. Are there areas of your life that, that you have not or will not allow Jesus to redeem? These, these doors are, are often marked with fear or guilt or shame, anxiety or secret sin, among other things. Will you invite Jesus into your spiritual home today, into your heart, and allow him to be the source of your hope, the truth in your expectations, and ignite a new fire of passion and joy in your life that will not be snuffed out in this world? Jesus asks us in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, he says, are you tired? Are you worn out, burned out on religion? Jesus says, come to me, get away with me, and I'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a rest and, and walk with me and work with me. Jesus says, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Jesus says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. He says, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Today, if you have not received the gift of God's eternal and unconditional love made visible in His Son, Jesus, if you are still on the road and Jesus is still pursuing you on that road, I invite you today to stop and invite Him in, to become part of Jesus' family, His not yet perfect family, but a family that seeks to imitate Christ and walk in the way of love, in commission, with the Holy Spirit. Would you be so bold this morning as to say yes to Jesus' gift to you of his eternal and unconditional love by agreeing with me in this prayer? Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and you showed you our God by coming back to life again. I accept your free forgiveness of my sins. I let go of my past failures. I switch to your plan for my life today, wanting you to direct my steps today and every day of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit today. Show me how to love you, Lord, with all my heart mind, soul, and strength, and how to love others the way you have loved me. I receive you. Help me put my hope in you and grow in the way of love today. In Jesus' name, amen. Until we see each other again, Next week, we will be together at the Mildred Owen Concert Hall in Pacifica. Until we see you again next Sunday morning, May 2nd, as we celebrate worship together and we celebrate communion together and formally lay hands on and receive one of our new pastors, Pastor Rick. May the love of Christ dwell in you richly as you encourage one another to live your eternal adventure now.